Thanks everybody for uh, taking the time on a cold uh, Saskatchewan uh, winter evening uh, for joining us tonight. Uh, this initiative is something that our board of directors have been uh, looking forward to providing to the membership for some time. And so we really feel that uh, it'll be valuable for you. And we are really happy to have Wendy Plandowski uh, be our facilitator for this evening and also the next session which will be on Wednesday, March 1st of next, uh, next Wednesday, Thursday, Thursday, next, March 2nd, next week. So uh, Wendy has been a great help for to our board in the creation of our strategic plan in the last year. And uh, I think you'll really uh, enjoy uh, the session tonight. Uh, Jessica has already asked, we're expecting it to be around 90 minutes. Uh, Jessica, we are taping it. And we'll provide that uh, along with uh, Wendy's PowerPoint to you after the fact, so you can share it with your board members. But I really encourage you, if you have questions, unmute yourself or or use the chat form, and uh, we'll try and help you as much as we can in answering those questions, because we don't want you walking away from here uh, thinking, man, I should ask the question, or, or you know, I, I, I'm not sure about what Wendy said. So please, uh, ask as many questions as you like, uh, and, uh, and I know that Wendy will be uh, happy to accommodate all of you. So I'm going to turn it over to Wendy, and uh, thank you again for attending tonight, everyone. Awesome. Well, thanks very much, everybody, for uh, again joining us on this nice cold evening. Um, it's it's an absolute pleasure to be here. Um, I'm zooming in from Mountain Standard Time. I just live on uh, the wrong side of the border, I guess you could say. Um, I can see Saskatchewan, uh, but I can't see the time zone. So uh, it's a little bit earlier for me than it is for you. But nevertheless, I will stick to the time so that you all get out of here um, as we said you would. We will take about a five minute break. Um, just a chance for everybody to stretch and, and uh, check their phones, et cetera, um, probably right in around that 7.45. And uh, then we'll come back and uh, we'll try to get all wrapped up here by 8.30, including some time for questions. And uh, so as Kelly mentioned, um, this is a, a two-part series. And so tonight we're covering off more of the board roles and responsibilities, constitution, bylaw policies, all of that fun stuff. Um, and I just like to get started off with a bit of a land acknowledgement. So as we gather here tonight, we acknowledge we are on treaty land and the homeland of the Métis. We pay our respects and give thanks to the First Nation and Métis ancestors of this place, those who walk beside us today and those who will follow us in years to come. We are all treaty people. And so I just wanna tell you a little bit about myself. So um, my passion for volunteering and nonprofit governance goes way, way back. Um, I'm an active volunteer in both Alberta and Saskatchewan. I'm currently the 2020, 2024 co-chair for the Saskatchewan Summer Games that are coming up in Lloydminster. Um, my husband and I have a small business uh, just outside of Lloydminster here. And I'm also the acting director of Startup Lloydminster. Um, I'm also the provincial chair on the Alberta side for the advisory care for Council for Cancer Care. And uh, on Twitter, by border, Wendy seems to be the way I go because I flip flop and back, back and forth between Alberta and Saskatchewan. Um, but uh, a lot of these governance sessions that I do, I do with the recreation and sport councils. Um, and it truly is a pleasure here to be here. And, and uh, working with uh, Timothy and Kelly and the board has just been a great opportunity for me to get to know um, Hockey Saskatchewan a lot better. Um, last year, I assisted with the refresh or the reimagining of the strategic plan. And, uh, and then part of that strategic plan was just to ensure that all of the amazing volunteers across the province had an opportunity to uh, take a look at some of the uh, board roles and responsibilities, and as well as just some of the ways that we can make our experience with minor hockey just a little bit better, maybe a little bit less stressful. I think that's always one of the goals that we have. And so our mission for tonight, um, we're going to talk a little bit about creating a roadmap. Oh my gosh, my cat just did that. I can't believe that. Um, you get to go away. That's the first time I've ever had that happen. 
Um, so the importance of a mission, vision, objectives to assist in the guiding and direction of your associations, um, not just your strategy, but also your decision making. And so we're going to talk a little bit about how we can make good decisions as volunteers. We're also going to talk a little bit about the difference between governance and operations. And I know um, I've given about 50 board roles and responsibility sessions on June in, on Zoom since COVID. And one of the things that always comes up is with arena boards and hockey boards and as hockey associations and different groups that, you know, how do we know the difference of whether we need to roll up our sleeves and be involved in the operations of our organization or whether we're just providing good decisions and good oversight. And so we're going to talk a little bit about that tonight and how you would be able to decipher that difference. Um, also about the creation of your constitution, your bylaws, policies, regulations, all of those really good documents that I think um, make the difference between us serving ourselves in our organizations and serving our players and our, um, our communities and, and that sort of thing. They're, they're the absolute um, perfect tool, I think, to make things just go that much smoother when it comes to our organizations. We're going to talk a little bit about board and executive structure, um, the importance of creating a job description to define roles and make sure that under everybody understands which lane they're in, essentially, in our minor hockey associations. Board oversight. Uh, so, you know, with the board oversight, we talk a little bit about that tonight and also in the session next week. Um, but just that understanding of, you know, what are our risks as board members, but also how can we mitigate any of those threats and risks that are coming up? when it comes to the management of our facilities, um, our employees um, and our volunteers. How can we work together as a unified board? I know that conflict is something that follows us everywhere. I like to use the term contrast and we'll talk a little bit about that. How we can recruit more volunteers. I know some of us are coming from small communities where it seems like you know, sometimes the same 10 or 20 people are doing a lot of the volunteer work. I know I was working with a, a young lady last week from uh, somewhere in Saskatchewan, and I think she said she was on six different boards and also employed by the municipality. So sometimes she wasn't sure which hat she was wearing. Uh, so we're going to talk a little bit about that as well. Um, how do we measure our success? And uh, if we are off track, how do we recalibrate? Um, a little bit again about conflict management um, and also um, conflict of interest policies. And then finally, we're gonna talk about the importance of communication and just how important it is that when we do make good decisions, uh, that we get that word out and that when there is some kind of an issue that we're open and transparent as volunteers and with our boards. So those are all the things we're gonna cover uh, in about 90 minutes. So it's gonna be quick talking tonight. Um, but as Kelly mentioned, um, please do turn your mic on, put a comment in the chat. Um, I am a very flexible facilitator. So I love it um, when people have questions or just wanna stop and, and just wanna talk about a particular issue. I think everybody enjoys that a little bit more rather than just listening to myself talk. Um, and uh, so please feel free to just raise your hand and get involved. So we're gonna talk a little bit about um, your strategy and your roadmap to success. And so, uh, as you know, maybe Hockey Saskatchewan embarked on a fairly extensive strategic planning uh, vision over the last couple of years. And so just in general with your organizations, we wanted to give a little bit of background on strategic planning and how important it is for your own local organizations to be able to embrace that vision and mission, um, whether it be one that you've adapted to your own and then also um, to understand where Hockey Saskatchewan and maybe even Hockey Canada is going. So a vision is a clear, comprehensive photograph of an organization at some point in the future. It provides direction because it describes what our organizations want to be like, um, what we want to be successful in the future and what that looks like and what we are trying to achieve. This is opposed to our mission and our mission statement is just a short statement of our organization's purpose, um, identifying the scope of our operations, what kind of product or service we provide, um, our primary customers, market, and geographic region of location. So this is going to be pretty standard for most hockey organizations. Um, and then maybe first and foremost, when it comes to our strategic plan, is what are our objectives? 
And so even in our own local communities, it's important to know that, um, you know, what objectives we're working towards, that sort of continuous improvement. And it could even be facility improvements. Uh, maybe you need an enhancement of your um, ice um, machine or um, capital infrastructure, that sort of thing. And so strategic planning is the activity that we use to set those priorities, where we focus our energy. Um, if we take a, we'll, we will take a look here at Hockey Saskatchewan's strategic plan, and you'll see that they've got pillars of excellence or areas where they're really going to be working to forward the organization and the, the goals, essentially, of all of you, the stakeholders. And once we are working toward common goals, that ability to establish agreement is just so much easier. And I do find that organizations that um, embark on some strategic planning or embrace a strategic plan tend to have less of that conflict and uh, tend to have more enjoyable experience essentially when it comes to the pursuit of sport and hockey, et cetera. So just so that um, everybody has a chance to see it again, just in case you haven't, um, the vision of Hockey Saskatchewan, of course, shaping characters for life more than a game, um, which I think is such a great vision. Um, the mission is to lead, develop, and promote positive hockey experiences for all. And, um, you know, some of my favorite strategic planning tools, which can be implemented at any time when you're on your hockey board, um, you could do a SWAT, for example. Um, for those of you who um, maybe have a big hockey tournament coming up, or maybe you've got elections coming up, that sort of thing, it's not a bad idea to have a bit of a 15 minute exercise where you would do something like a SWAT. And I'll show you Hockey Saskatchewan SWAT here in a second. Um, but a SWAT is essentially just where you take a piece of paper, a great big, like, poster board. Um, you put strengths in the top left-hand corner, weaknesses in the top right hand, left-hand corner, right-hand corner, sorry. You'll see it when I show you the next slide. Um, bottom left is your opportunities and bottom right is your threats. And that's something that you can do, like I say, before um, you could do that monthly um, if you wanted to. And it's just a way to really start to mitigate some of those weaknesses that you might have as an organization, identify any risks. But also, you know, if you're embarking on some kind of an exciting project to make sure that you're really seizing any of those exciting opportunities that might be coming out for you. You can also do a bit of a start, stop, continue exercise um, at your board table where, you know, you might want to say, OK, these are some of the things we've done in the past. Um, maybe we don't want to do that anymore. What are the things that we want to continue to do as a minor hockey organization? And then if you find that your board is not as engaged as they could be. Um, and if you're maybe you're the chair or minor hockey president um, in your community, one of the things that you can do is just to remind people about why we're there. I like to just call it the goosebump moment because for me that's sort of that epitome as a volunteer where I think to myself, gosh, if we hadn't all worked together and put Hockey Day in Canada on or, you know, this great big amazing event, um, how many lives might not have been, you know, improved or changed, or maybe those dollars wouldn't have been brought into our local community for that tournament, or, you know, just all of the great things that happen um, as a result, when you think about that vision, shaping characters for life. Um, I was just at the opening ceremonies of the Saskatchewan Games on Sunday, and they had an athlete panel, and the athlete panel was talking about the impact that sport had had on their lives and how uh, it really took them down a different path. And so when you think about shaping those characters on your hockey teams and how much uh, experience, those experiences are maybe going to put them on a different and important and perhaps wonderful um, chart for their life. Um, I think that's really important sometimes to remind ourselves as volunteers that all of this time and sweat and effort that we're putting into our communities and our organizations is really having an impact. So as I promised, here's an example of a SWOT analysis. So in this case, it's just linear. They've got their strengths, they've got their weaknesses, they've got their opportunities and their threats. This was something that was done um, last year as part of that reimagining process for the strategic plan. 
Um, and again, it's just a really great um, activity that you can do in a really quick amount of time. Um, you could even do it as just an elite uh, hockey association, for example, or even at a team level, um, you could do something like this. And uh, it's just a, a really great way to, um, again, mitigate risks and that sort of thing. So this is the strategic plan that um, Hockey Saskatchewan, you might see these in your rinks or in some of the rinks across the province. Um, again, you'll notice that it has about a three-year shelf life. Um, the strategic objectives, which I think are really important, um, are to grow the game, organizational development, community and social impact, program consistency, event and team success, and continued financial stability. And, uh, you know, I think um, most of those strategic objectives are pretty standard. Um, one of the ones that was very unique was community and social impact, which I thought was, um, you know, really innovative. And, and then there's some values here as well. And those values are fun, safety, community, inclusivity, respect, and passion. So does anybody have any questions or comments when they look at that strategic plan and, and um, what it might mean at your local levels? or any comments about that? You're just soaking it all in. That's okay. So how do we use hockey strategic or hockey Saskatchewan strategic plan to help, help us make good decisions? And I think that's really important because how many of us on our local boards are, um, you know, at every turn, it seems like we're, we're having to make these really pivotal decisions and certainly coming out of the pandemic, uh, we were being forced to make decisions that were having significant, significant impacts, not just on our hockey players, but on our communities and our province. And so there is a way that we can actually use the strategic plan when we're making decisions. And so one of the first ways is to look at those values. So no matter what board I'm on as a community member, whether it's, uh, you know, Rotary, music festival, baseball, hockey, it's always important to know what the values of the organization are. And you can have your own values in your community that coincide with this. Um, but, you know, I think I love the fact that the values are so clear. And so when we make decisions, when we're, we're forced to make those decisions, do what, you know, do our values align with those decisions that we're making? And so even as ourselves, we can identify what our own personal values are as well and make sure that those are in alignment with the decisions that we're making at our local hockey levels. This is a, a really good hierarchy of rules that govern our organizations as nonprofits. And I love this uh, flow chart because really, you know, at the very height of any decisions that we make in our hockey associations, first and foremost, we have to think about our laws, um, our uh, criminal code, um, anything health and safety wise that we could be violating. That's sort of at the top of the pyramid. So um, the other thing that might be um, is would be your um, incorporation like the Societies Act, other legislation, like if you have employees and um, are you following the Employment Standards Act? So there's sort of those federal and provincial laws that um, reign supreme with all of our decision making. And so you need to kind of know who you're answering to with some of those decisions. Next would be your internal rules that would apply. And so that might be your constitution, um, your bylaws. Um, and, and that's where you would then start to say, okay, how many officers are, are supposed to be in our organization or, um, you know, how often are we supposed to be meeting? Um, when are we supposed to be having our annual meeting? That'll all be laid out in the constitution and bylaws of your organizations. The next, um, checkpoint along making decisions will be our policies. And so, you know, conflict of interest policies, personnel policies, maybe banking resolutions and how you're doing your finances. And then finally, is that administrative procedures piece. And so, for example, you know, do you have office hours? Um, how, what are the hours that your rink is open? When do you put your ice in? Um, you know, all of those things that are more procedure based. And so if we follow this kind of a flow chart when we're making decisions, it should really help, I think, to um, make the decision making faster 
it's really easy when you've got a debate around the table, especially if you're the president um, of your minor hockey association to be able to just refer to some of these documents. I know as a chair myself, I find it easier sometimes to refer to a piece of paper and bring people back to um, a binder or a document than call somebody out on their opinion, um, right? Which can get quite personal. And so having these documents close at hand can make uh, just all of the decisions that we make just a little bit easier. So now we're gonna talk a little bit about understanding the roles and responsibilities of our associations. And so let's start at the top. So why do boards exist? Um, well, in most cases, boards are required by law. We act as agents and owners of you know, facilities and arenas and that kind of thing. We have a fiduciary responsibility to oversee the use of resources. And so many of our minor hockey associations are bringing in a lot of funds through you know, fundraising and sponsorships and through ho hockey user fees and et cetera, et cetera. And so we have, we have a fiduciary responsibility if we're on the board to make sure that those funds are being stewarded appropriately. Also, we set the direction of the organization. We are leaders in our community. We develop those moral, ethical, and operating standards. We create policy, um, we do the decision-making, and we provide that oversight. Now let's talk a little bit about who we need to be as board members. And I think this is really important. And, you know, we have, as a board member, we have a responsibility to listen to our constituents, even when we don't necessarily um, follow their train of thought or their opinion, we still have, we still have a responsibility to do that listening. Um, we want to analyze that thought process, even if we don't agree on it. Uh, think clearly and creatively. If we can't find a solution locally, maybe look to other minor hockey associations and see if they've encountered those problems and do some digging to find some best practices around the province. We need to work well with people individually, one-on-one, -on -one, but then also in a group. We need to be willing to ask questions, um, take responsibility, and follow through on given assignments. And so if we're tasked something as a volunteer, whether it's you know to do the tournament scheduling or find the sponsors or that sort of thing, we need to make sure that we roll up our sleeves and get that done. We should be developing skills to recruit other board members and, and future board members and other volunteers. Um, definitely to be able to read and understand financial statements, which we're gonna talk about in our next session next week. Um, also um, to possess honesty, sensitivity, um, and tolerance of differing views, and then have that sort of personal integrity, understand our own values, um, our concern for our community, and then it always helps to have a sense of humor, I think, at times. Anything that any of you can add to that, um, other qualities that we need to have as minor hockey board members in our communities? What have I forgotten? Hockey. Yeah, exactly. We need to we need to love hockey, right? It's pretty important. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, Wendy Brooklyn said reliable. Yes, absolutely. 100%. And you know, um, I think that's the the comment around hockey too. Um, I think it's really important that we get involved with organizations that we we feel a kinship to, that we feel a passion for, um, whether it's because our kids are in it or or they're not. Or, um, but I, I do think that understanding the game is really really important, um, and that's why all of you have given up a, a night tonight. I know. A couple more comments, Wendy. Uh, Sarah said that the ability to be impartial, which mm -hmm. really I think uh, connects with uh, conflict of interest that you'll okay. touch on. And then Chantel talked about transparency. Most, most of us are parents of hockey players, she said, so. Great additions to that, thank you. So here's some expectations of board members. Uh, you know, it's good if we can attend all board meetings. I'll, I know that's not always possible, um, but definitely to review board materials before meetings, um, serve on any committees as required, 
inform others of the role of the organization. And I think this is really important, especially in minor hockey associations, that we're a positive champion for our organization. And I'm going to talk a little bit about communication and what we can do um, to make sure that the right messages are getting out to the right people. Also, again, to help with recruitment. Keeping up to date on trends that are affecting the organization and, and forwarding those on to the employees of the organization. And, you know, I think that it's incredibly important. I know myself being on different boards and working for different organizations as employees. Um, it's, it's wonderful when someone sends me an article. And so if you see something interesting happening in another community or another province, um, or even something innovative that's happening in a different part of the world, you know, take a few seconds and fire that off to Kelly or fire it off to the rest of your minor hockey board and, and just keep sharing those best practices. And that's how that innovation will sometimes happen. Following board policies and procedures, um, refraining from making special requests of, of employees, um, and that sort of thing, and then carrying out those fiduciary responsibilities when it comes to protecting money and protecting property. So are you a champion for your board? And I, and I think that that's something that we often, we, we believe that we're champions, um, but I just included a, a little bit of a quiz, I guess you could say. And so, you know, am I aware of what is expected of me as a board member? Do I have good record um, or good record of meeting attendance? Um, do I read the minutes, reports, et cetera, before board meetings? Could I find the bylaws and constitution if I wanted to? Is it listed on our website or where would I be able to find that? Am I encouraging other board members to express opinions at board meetings? Um, I am encouraged by other board, med board members to express my own opinion. I'm a good listener at board meetings. I follow through on the things I have said I would do that reliability and accountability and maintain confidentiality of board decisions. And so if you are sitting around the board table and you're talking about a particular issue and you have a question about what can be shared outside of the boardroom, it's really important to ask that question because I, I guarantee that if you're wondering that, your other board members will also be wondering, you know, what is public um, in this decision or in this particular instance and what do we need to keep um, uh, private due to our own policies and procedures and, and protecting players, et cetera. So let's talk about some of the roles of a board. And, and so there are, you know, three hierarchical roles for boards. One is a legal um, responsibility. And so in addition to the board's responsibilities as a governing body, individual board members are also bound by our legal obligations. And so that's the duties of care, loyalty, and obedience. And these duties serve in the courts as the test for compliance. You know, if a board member's performance or decision were to ever become a legal issue, um, we do need to understand what we are obligated to do as part of a board. And then there's also those ethical roles that we have. And so one of the key ethical reasons to build a board is to create a structure that functions to assure that all of our stakeholders in our organization is in good hands and that we're acting as an agent for our membership. Um, for those hockey players, parents, um, community members, that sort of thing. And then finally, it's just that practical reason. I mean, who are we kidding, right? The board is made up of individuals who at one time or another are the worker bees. They are the um, people who are, who are making sure that the work gets done, that the games get played, and um, that we are shaping those characters for life, um, like it says in the vision. There are a few different types of boards. And so, you know, depending on, you might be on other boards in your community, you might be on a, a library board or a, uh, another sport board, that sort of thing. Um, but essentially there are governance boards, operations boards, and then sometimes you can get a management team model type of board. And, and so that management team model, um, I saw it come into play a couple times in COVID um, where key employees were taken out of the equation due to illness. And so board members actually had to step in and run, run an organization. Um, I know it happens in some cases. Um, and then there's that, you know, sort of governance organization. And that would be very much like Hockey Saskatchewan's board. Um, they're providing oversight, decision-making, representing the membership, 
Um, and then there's operations boards. And operations boards are typically what you would see with an arena board, um, maybe not so much a hockey, uh, minor hockey association board, but certainly with an arena board. They're often the ones that are working in the concession, making sure the Zamboni's running, um, all of those things, janitorial. Um, and so governance boards are very much um, noses in and fingers out. Um, I like this little picture here because it just reminds me of exactly what we should be like as board members. Um, and essentially a governance board sets policy and direction, but has few roles in supporting the organization outside of board meetings. So there are usually paid staff in those cases who fulfill the activities of the board. So when you think about that strategic plan of Hockey Saskatchewan's, there might have only been one or two things on that list of objectives that the actual board members of Hockey Saskatchewan would be doing themselves. They're tasking that to the team at Hockey Saskatchewan, the employees, to make sure that the organization is moving forward. And so once again, noses in, fingers out. An operations board is often very hands-on and are involved in, you know, operating facilities um, and taking on the role of paid staff. And I, I like to use the example, they are rewarded in other ways, that's for sure. Um, my own example, I, I was CEO of the Lloydminster Region Health Foundation, and uh, their board members were very much um, providing decision-making and oversight and fundraising. We were a fundraising organization. And so they rolled up their sleeves and raised a lot of money for the community for en enhancing healthcare. Um, as opposed to when I was on the music festival board um, where we did everything. Um, we didn't have any paid employees. We, we took all the registrations for music festival. We, we did everything. We were very much an operations board. Um, do any of you have any questions about the difference between a governance board, an operation board, or a hybrid in some case? Because in some cases, you're setting policy and direction, but then you're also um, performing some of those roles um, in minor hockey as well. Any thoughts or questions on what type of boards you are? Okay, so let's talk a little bit about the bylaws, policies, and procedures. And so bylaws, um, you know, the function of bylaws um, or the constitution um, define the governing and operational rules of the corporation or the organization under which the board of directors and management operate on behalf of the membership. It often specifies when the board would meet, um, when an AGM would take place, the term of office for board members, who, appoint, who appoints those board members, how are minor hockey association um, chairs elected, all of those things will be listed in the bylaws. Um, they're often required by law if you are a registered not-for-profit or a registered charity providing receding, that sort of thing. Um, here is an example of a bylaw index, for example. And so, you know, you might have um, membership terms, like what classes of membership are there? How can you terminate memberships? Um, what is the registered office? Um, execution of contracts, how would that happen? Um, who's composed of an executive of a minor hockey association? When do they meet? Um, when does the executive committee meet? What are the powers and duties? Um, how, how are suspensions, complaints, and appeals held um, and handled? Appointment of an auditor, any notices, amendments of bylaws, how would you do that? Um, what is the fiscal year? Is it a you know, December 31st year end, March 31st year end? How do we handle our finances? If we need to borrow money, how do we do that? So those would be examples of a table of contents for some bylaws. Um, an amazing thing is that if you go onto Hockey Saskatchewan's uh, website, you'll see that they actually have a constitution and bylaws template, um, which is amazing. And so you can actually go into this and um, start to work on your own uh, constitution and bylaws. Um, Kelly, is there anything that you want to add about people going in and, and working with your template? No, I think it's uh, you know, uh, I'm I'm one of the fellows that probably most professors didn't like because I think we can plagiarize off other associations and 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 search out some of the best examples. 
Ours might not be the best, but at least it's a great start and you can use it because we've gone out and plagiarized from some others. So I really encourage you to do it because it really outlines things nicely so that uh, if there if something comes up in a meeting, you can easily get to something and instead of you know going through pages. So I think it's really important. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. And I I also couldn't agree more with your comment that um, as as nonprofit organizations, there is no reason for us to start from scratch when it comes to developing constitution, bylaws, policies, procedures. There are so many tremendous um, organizations out there who have already done the hard work. What I love to do when I'm undertaking a constitution or a bylaw um, review is um, actually, so I'll show you um, where it's found on the website um, for sure. There you go, it's just right there. Um, and uh, yeah, I think it's listed under other important documents, but we can take a look at that too. Um, yeah. And I think that you're you're not sharing your screen, Wendy. So maybe that's why people. I had a hyperlink to it, um, okay. and so that's why it was so easy for me to find it. And again, let's see if I can show you. So it's under the path is under members, and then forms on Hockey Saskatchewan's site. I can probably pull up, pull that up right here, maybe. The joys of computers. Yeah. Yeah, there's lots of lots of things within our uh, uh, our toolbox, our MHA toolbox there that. Uh, that you can take a look at. And one of the one of the things that we also want to do is 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 create a bit of a resource hub there for people, mm -hmm. the, you know, where you say additional resources. I think we need to make it more. Uh, we've talked about it in our uh, within our staff that people could encourage people to go and, and put things that work for you, as Wendy talked about at the beginning of the of the session and and so that you're sharing best practices and i think it'd be really positive uh because you know what works in in an association of 50 members might not work in an association of 500 members and vice versa and it, just think about this was close to 200 minor hockey associations in our province only around 50 have more than 100 players registered so a lot a lot of you are smaller and need that help yeah, and I think when I when I like to do a policy review or a bylaw review, I like to take three of three examples from other organizations. And so you could take the Hockey Saskatchewan template. You could find two other uh, communities that are like sized, or maybe one other community that's like sized to you, um, and ask them if they've gone through the process. And then the other um, one that I love to do is one uh, hockey association that I aspire to be like. I was always like, wow, I like their stuff, or they seem so innovative. Ask them also um, for a sample of theirs. And then one of the best ways to get this done is just to ask for some volunteers at your board table, two or three people to sit on a bit of a policy or a governance committee and um, roll up the sleeves, do the hard work and bring it back to the board for um, commentary and endorsement. Okay, so now let's talk a little bit about policies and procedures. And so the function of policies are to define the operations of our boards. They are the guiding principles that set the direction um, and they form the basis for determining our procedures. They're usually pretty flexible and, and then procedures. So it's, it's really mu very much like a funnel. So we've got our constitution, our bylaws, our policies and our procedures. And procedures are often guides to action they assist with the day-to-day -day operations of our organizations, you know, how we might deal with a, you know, a some kind of an incident in our rinks um, to, um, you know, what, what would constitute the closing of our rink on certain days, um, employee conduct, uh, and other operational matters. The great thing about policies and procedures, and this is what I find as I work with different organizations across the province, is the 
the organizations that do the hard work around policies and procedures are often the ones that spend the most amount of time doing what they love, and that would be hockey. The ones that haven't taken the time necessarily to get these bylaws, policies and procedures in place are the ones that tend to get um, very much uh, working on the organization itself as opposed to the love of the game. They're worried more about conflict or um, you know, these kinds of things than actually getting out there and just getting things done. So that's the that's the really the magic about policies and procedures. Here's some important hockey policies um, that you might want to consider. Um, and so, you know, you've got um, complaints, dispute resolution, disciplinary action, criminal record checks, registration, equipment guidelines, coach selection. Um, I took this right off of Warman Minor Hockey Association. Um, which they have a great website that uh, Kelly had pointed me in the direction for some of my research. Um, team and parent meetings, coaches and managers meetings, and all of these other things. And so these are just some of the important ho hockey policies. Um, I know one of the ones that we really are going to spend some time talking about is that conflict of interest as well, which is really important to have um, in your policy guidebook. Now, when it comes to board structure and making sure that there are good policies and procedures in place. Um, the board chair or the minor hockey association president is usually the one that should be the champion for developing these procedures and policies. And having that structure in place does help to just make sure that everybody's terms is more memorable and enjoyable. It allows for better communication, um, maximizes valuable time, keeps important matters from falling through the cracks, keep staff and, vol and volunteers informed, and maybe more than anything, it shows respect for everybody that's involved, which I think is just um, so important, especially in our um, small communities where um, we, you know, we don't want to have a problem with somebody at the hockey rink if we have to work with them the next day, um, et cetera, right? And I find that that's something that just really helps when we have this good governance in place. So, don't want to spend a whole bunch of time talking about the different roles that are on the hockey associations, but you know some of the things that if you are on the board, um, good board chairs, for example, will often have these qualities. They will attract followers and motivate people. They focus on the big issues. They make effectiveness a priority. They have the capability to set direction. They're willing to take some calculated risks, and I think this is a really important one. So you know. The board that or the board chair that maybe says, oh, it's, you know, it's going to cost too much money to do that or um, it's going to take too much time. We won't have enough volunteers to pull off a big tournament or a big event or or, you know, add an extra league or something like that. Uh, leaders tend to be able to mitigate those risks and take some calculated risks. They need to be approachable, available, be fair and open minded develop and use good facilitation skills. And maybe more than anything, they need to be more focused on the organization's goals and agenda than their own. I often like to just say to everybody, you know, do you have an amazing mentor or um, president that you've ever worked with or a chair? I actually put a picture in this month of my mentor, Mr. Vic Juba. Um, he's uh, from Lloydminster and he exuded all of the above traits and it was just a pleasure to learn from him when I was on a board with him. So getting the job done and, and you know, if you're on a board and you're in a leadership role, whether you're, you know, a coach manager, a manager of a team, that sort of thing, learning how to delegate in the right way is really, really helpful. And, you know, if we can't delegate, if we're scared to ask people to help us with some of our events and that sort of thing, if, you know, if we are the board president or the um, minor hockey president, we need to know that we can't carry the bulk of the load ourselves. If we're doing all the work, if we're the team manager and we're doing all the work, we're going to run into problems. Um, we need to have engaged teams, community, and benefactors, and, and we can't do all of the work ourselves. Um, nobody wants to work with somebody who's a martyr. So if we practice the art of delegation together, we can see that it's absolutely magical when we ask the right person in the right way to help us. And that's when all the wheels will start rolling together 
and essentially take us where we need to go in our minor hockey associations. Another really important role is that board secretary. And so they maintain records of the board. They manage the meetings of our minutes. They ensure minutes are distributed to meet to members shortly after each meeting. And they're sufficiently familiar with any legal documents that we might have to refer to during meetings. And then of course the board treasurer. And so they manage the finances of our organization. They administer any of the fiscal matters. They provide the budget to the board um, for approval and they ensure that we're following the financial policies and procedures that have been set out. And we're gonna talk quite a bit about finances in next week's session. Here we are, job descriptions. So for any of your volunteers um, and your employees, it's really important to provide them with a job description. And I find that it's one of the key things when we start to recruit volunteers as well. Um, it's one of the best ways to start a conversation with somebody that you might wanna take on a different role in the board is to be able to provide them with that job description. So there are several job descriptions for minor hockey that you can use as resources. Um, I know just when I was doing my research for tonight's presentation, I was able to go on to several minor hockey associations and they had those job descriptions already listed. So as a couple of you have pointed out, don't reinvent the wheel. Um, it is very important to ensure that everyone understands their objectives of their role because they will then understand where their line of authority starts and ends so that they can be successful. Um, there won't be any overreaching um, and people will kind of stay in their lane, essentially. Um, and having a job description for coaches, managers, board roles is just really important also that it's reviewed on a regular basis. And one of the things that I have found is that sometimes we find that one particular role gets too big for um, one person to handle. And so we might have to split it into two, uh, maybe have a co-role um, or even have um, sometimes a paid employee take on functions of some of the roles, which I think when we have high burnout of employee or of volunteers, what that might be something that we have to look at in our organizations is, um, are there positions that we're calling on volunteers to do that are just too onerous? And maybe we need to um, hire that out, you know, as almost an honorarium or something to perform that role. A lot of nonprofits that I've worked with have found that when it comes to their secretary treasurer role, that they, they can only keep a person in that secretary treasurer role for a year and then they leave the organization because the work was just overwhelming and too much. And so quite often in those organizations, um, if they weigh the, um, I guess, the benefit of perhaps allocating some actual financial resources to hiring some of that out, um, it might be minimal when they look at it, you know, maybe $400 a month, um, as opposed to losing those good volunteers um, that are just feeling like the workload is too much that they can't give that um, much time and energy into the position. So that's something that as leadership on your boards, you have to sometimes take a look at and say, hmm, you know, we might have to um, start looking at this as a paid arrangement for some things. So let's talk a little bit about board oversight. And so, uh, you know, here's a question for you. What are the first things that come to mind when you think about board oversight? Um, I'm always curious to know if people are, are thinking in terms of board oversight, you can throw it in the chat. So when I say that, you know, we're gonna start talking tonight about board oversight, um, what's the first thing that comes to mind? Or are you all just thinking, just gonna wait for that slide to pop up because I'm not sure. <laughs> so in a lot of boards that I work with, when I talk about board oversight, the first thing they think about is, um, you know, finances and what might happen if um, somebody has sticky fingers, uh, maybe some fraud that could happen, maybe not having enough board liability insurance, uh, maybe somebody falling and breaking their ankle, um, and then suing the hockey board or something like that. So those are the things that come to mind for me when I think about oversight is protection of assets, protection of physical assets. Um, Jessica said um, board culture and environment. Absolutely, that's a really important part of board oversight, making sure that we're not part of a toxic group, that it's um, a really high performing kind of a, a great organization to be with. So awesome. If you think of any other things, don't just, I hope that none of you ever wake up in the middle of the night thinking about your boards. 
Um, and if you do, I guarantee it'll be because of some oversight issue. I think, uh, Wendy, just to touch a little bit on that, based on what's happened across the country in the last 10 months, and that's all you hear about in the media is the, the culture of hockey. And that can take up, that that's, uh, uh, can go down a number of different rabbit holes in terms of what what is the culture of hockey. But uh, mm -hmm. it certainly, I know in dealing with associations around the province, it's different in, in all areas of the province because there's different cultures that are created. And so that's, uh, I think it's really important. I think uh, Jessica really touched on something really good there, the culture and environment that the people create. I couldn't agree more. And, you know, I think that's why I was so impressed, Kelly, when your strategic plan included that social responsibility piece. Um, and here's why, because, you know, I'm really proud of the work that Hockey Saskatchewan did on that, even though I just had a small role in it. And, and I know that when some of those stories have come out in the public, um, as contemporary and tragic as they are in whatever locale they are, my first next thought was around that strategic objective that you have as an organization around that social um, responsibility and community piece. And so when a person can, uh, you know, put the policies and procedures in place to prevent nefarious things or things that we don't want to dwell on from happening, um, things that don't go with our code of conduct, that sort of thing, and then focus on moving forward by spending time, you know, uh, having our hockey teams going out and, um, you know, reading in schools and doing amazing things and showing that leadership and shaping characters for life. Um, I think that's just such an important segue of, you know, moving forward in a you know, taking good organizations and making them great organizations, right? So love that. So there are three primary responsibilities when it comes to board oversight. Um, obviously, the diligence is one to act reasonably, prudently, in good faith, and with a view to the best interest of the organization and your membership. That loyalty piece, so making sure that you're placing the interests of the organization first, um, not to use our position as a minor hockey director to further our own private interests, and then obedience, so acting within the scope of our governing policies, um, ensuring that the scope of any other laws, rules, and regulations that apply to the organiz organization are being adhered to, such as health and safety, workers' comp, uh, some of those overarching provincial and federal rules. A volunteer director who fails to fulfill their duties as outlined above could be liable. And so the term liability refers to the responsibility of directors and organizations for the consequences of conduct that fails to meet some predetermined legal standard. So usually the term consequences refers to damage or loss experienced by someone and being responsible for the consequences then means maybe even having to pay financial compensation. And so um, I'll, I'll we'll put it in terms of financial. Uh, so if we have employees in our minor hockey association and we forget to pay our remittances to CRA, um, we could get slammed with um, interest uh, or fines and penalties. And so that's, you know, money that's going to have to come out of our hockey fees to pay for something that probably if somebody had followed the correct policies and procedures, um, we wouldn't have that loss to experience, right? So those are just some of the ways that there would be consequences if we don't follow our roles and, and duties as outlined um, with our oversight documents. And I think it's really important when we think about our own communities and how many hats we're wearing, which hat we're wearing when we're at the minor hockey association table or in the rink or in the grocery store, et cetera. Um, in a small organization, the board might be hands-on, um, you know, with a director wearing multiple hats. So in addition to our role as director overseeing the activities of our organization, we might also have um, a day-to-day -day operation role in the organization. Um, we also might be on town council or something like that. 
And, and so that's why quite often as organizations reach maturity, um, the board does oftentimes become more of a governance board with uh, paid employees doing some of those things that maybe we did um, like, you know, cleaning the ice or, you know, those kinds of things. Because I mean, there are still a lot of rinks where, um, you know, the minor hockey board is doing everything. And, and so it's kind of a evolution almost, I guess you could say, depending on how many resources you have in your communities, um, what type of board you are and how many hats you wear. And I guess my whole thought premise around this slide is just to always know which hat you are wearing and being loyal to that particular organization. And so if you are on the egg society, for example, but you're at a minor hockey meeting, it's important that you don't um, get confused on which organization you're being loyal to essentially in those decisions that you're having to make. And that's what we'll talk a little bit about with conflict of interest as well. Yeah, Wendy, if it's Kelly, I think that what's really key on, on that wearing multiple hats is getting back to where you, you had talked about defining roles on a board because there are some people that wanna be just workers and uh, and there's other people that would like to maybe just deal with governance. And so if you have those roles uh, really defined, that one, you know, helps to recruit people, but also tells people where they fit in. And so I think it's uh, it's re that's really important because you can you can, especially in a smaller minor hockey, like I said, most of ours are really they're a hybrid and yeah. a little bit of governance and mostly operational, but I think it's always important to have a couple of people that really want to focus on on the governance and the creating good policies. And then you do need your workers. So true. And you know, I was just chatting with um, Nicole Clow, who's was just the general manager at the Arctic Games up in Fort McMurray, and and uh, she's a good Saskatchewan uh, sport hero, I guess you could say. And she was telling me that uh, the board of directors for the Arctic Games was very much governance. Um, they they saw themselves as providing uh, very much the oversight and decision making, which was quite different than you know, say, working with the Saskatchewan Games body or something like that. Um, where people want to roll up their sleeves and be worker bees and get involved and, um, you know, sell 50-50 tickets and work the gate in the penalty box and those kinds of things. And understanding what makes us happy as volunteers, I think, is really important. Somebody that likes to write policies might not want to work in the rink at all, but we need everybody um, with those skill sets to make our minor hockey associations great. One of the things I love to remind people that we can give as volunteers, we can give our time, we can give our talent, we can give our trust, and we can give our treasures. And, and so deciding what and when we can give is, um, it's really a magical kind of a thing, so. So now let's talk quickly about the duty of loyalty, which I just kind of mentioned, but the duty of loyalty is also known as the fiduciary duty. It requires that a director act honestly and in good faith in the best interests of the organization. It's one of the primary duties of a director. Um, it's a personal duty. We can't delegate that duty of loyalty to anybody else. The duty to exercise power. So directors are ultimately responsible for our organizations and making good decisions. Um, we are responsible for furthering the organization's goals and objectives and ensuring that um, we aren't breaching our duty through inaction or inattention. Directors need to develop standards for measuring staff performance, carrying out annual performance reviews if we have uh, executive directors of our hockey associations, that sort of thing. We have the duty of obedience, and so we need to comply with any applicable laws. We've talked about this a lot. Um, and then also making sure that our corporate decisions are being implemented. So it's one thing as a board to say that we're going to do something. It's another thing to make sure we have the duty to act, that we follow through on some of those um, difficult decisions and, and things. So developing your risk management policies. And so boards do need to take the lead in developing, um, understanding what our risks are in our local communities, but we don't need to necessarily do it alone. Um, we can definitely call upon, uh, you know, someone like Kelly with his expertise or other pertinent staff members to assist us in identifying what kind of risk there could be. 
through development of risk management policies, um, while it is a lengthy process, it is really, really an important one when it comes to understanding our own individual responsibilities. So, you know, for example, understanding our board operator or our board liability insurance, those kinds of things. An important aspect of establishing risk management policies is that it raises awareness among leadership about the different types of risks and how to be vigilant as our organizations grow. And so just even, you know, thinking about the ice in the parking lot, um, you know, any health and safety hazards that you have in your facilities, um, obviously harassment um, risk, um, all of those things that we don't, this kind of the things we don't want to think about, but the things that we have to think about so that we aren't um, dealing with any ne negative repercussions. So here's some risk policies that you might want to consider that are just standard. Uh, so obviously some financial risk policies, legal risk policies, human resources, um, reputation, which I think is, is something that is plaguing a lot of organizations right now. Um, cyber risk policies, so policies around social media, that sort of thing, compliance, and then property. And so both physical and intellectual as well. So the importance of policies and procedures in board oversight, um, let's talk a little bit about conflict of interest, and then I'll just pause for a second to see if anyone has any questions. So, you know, one of the reasons that we put this session together was because there are so many questions related to conflict of interest. And um, if you've ever been in any of my sessions before when it comes to board governance, you'll note that I'm really passionate that we have to take the kid gloves off of conflict of interest so that we can deal with issues at every turn, um, including if we have agendas for our minor hockey association meetings, having that conflict of interest disclosure right at the top of your agenda. At our next session, we're going to show some sample agendas and that sort of thing and how you can do that. Um, but, you know, additionally, I, I think we need to help our team members, our peers to understand that when we do disclose a conflict of interest, we are doing that not just to protect us, but also to ensure that our contribution and our ties to minor hockey or whatever nonprofit it is that we are on don't negatively impact our ability to live and work in our communities or for our kids to play sports on or, you know, in organizations that we're board members for or coaches for, et cetera. And so just really understanding that conflict of interest doesn't have to be um, this big negative beast. In fact, it can be the pathway for us to actually serve our communities and not have our family members um, and our employers, um, those kinds of things suffer as a result of this goodwill that we have. So the conflict of interest definition, so this is taken right from Hockey Saskatchewan's um, handbook is that um, you know for a volunteer it refers to any member of the hockey saskatchewan board of directors um, this is for hockey saskatchewan um, as an employee refers to any person employed by hockey saskatchewan um, the conflict of interest is that any situation in which an individual's decision making um, which should always be in the best interest of the association is influenced or could be influenced by a personal family financial business or other private interest and um, again, I've hyperlinked this um, so that you can just take a look at it right on the Hockey Saskatchewan website as far as their definition, definition of a conflict of interest goes. And um, we'll just take a second and pull that up. And so again, this is coming from their handbook um, right on their website. So hopefully if you pull down your Zoom bar, if your Zoom bar is at the top, um, you should be able to see the path right through um, to that Hockey Saskatchewan if you're up there. And, uh, and so there's just a number of really good uh, statements around the conflict of interest. Um, what uh, the management of affairs, acceptance of gifts, um, use of information, interaction with family members, all of those things. And we're gonna actually at our next session next week, we're gonna look at some scenarios for conflict of interest. Um, and it's it's a really fun session because we'll actually create some um, scenarios where we get to vote on whether or not it's a conflict of interest or not. And uh, because some of them are going to be like, hmm, I didn't think that was a conflict of interest. But when we start to evaluate, we might be surprised that it is a conflict of interest. 
any questions of conflict of interest um, and how it relates to board oversight? I think this is something, uh, Wendy, that uh, certainly Derek and I deal with on a daily basis in the office when we have conflicts that come to us within a minor hockey association is is the the importance of conflict of interest and that's where it, it really creates some real conflict and 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 bitterness and and also goes to you talked about you know, the reputation uh, of an association i think it's really important and and ultimately that that will impact your ability to recruit parents to put their kids in the game because if their parents hear that it's a, it's a, there's a lot of negativity within the community and within the minor hockey association. Why would I wanna put my kid into that environment? Why would I wanna be part of that environment? So I think it's, it's really important. And, um, you know, and, and that's what uh, their next session will be uh, really vital to talk about. Yeah, and I think it also affects our ability to fundraise and it affects our ability to, you know, if we're taking on a big capital project to get corporate support and community support. And so you're right, reputation is a big one. And and uh, next week we'll dive into our values and how we can make sure that we don't suffer um, if, we, uh, if we are part of a, you know, nobody goes into being a volunteer with um, malevolent um, or um, ill-intentioned uh, beliefs or desires. I think everybody that puts their hand up and says they want to help out um, has good intentions. And so we just want to really make sure that uh, we have a good conflict of interest policy and disclosure so that we don't suffer as a result of that. And nor do our kids um, or our um, employers, like I've mentioned, um, and that sort of thing. So all right, let's keep going. We, we've got about 15 minutes left. So this is where I start to talk a little bit more like a auctioneer to get through everything. So so now we want to talk about um, recruitment and succession planning um, on our boards and how important that is. Um, you know, the first thing we want to do is we want to make sure that when we do need volunteers to step up and start helping us out, we, we do market our recruitment strategy a little bit. And so think about the demographics of our volunteers who have been, I, I love to almost create an avatar um, in our communities. And so when I think about, oh, that great volunteer for minor hockey, um, I picture them in my mind, like I'm thinking about one person right now whose kids are in hockey and she always is positive and she, um, you know, steps up and helps with all kinds of different things, including, um, you know, planning tournaments and everything else. And I think, okay, if she's one avatar that I'm thinking of, where do I find more people just like her? Um, and so one of the things you can do is ask her if she has any friends um, and that sort of thing, but create a bit of a job description of that person. You know, this is what our, this is what our volunteer rock star looks like. Um, these are the things that they do. And then how do you get their attention? Where do you find them? What channels are they listening to? Um, is it social media? Is it, you know, um, having a table set up at, at um, sign up night for registration, hockey registration, and asking people if they want to volunteer, something as simple as that. Um, and so just making sure that we actually do have a bit of a strategy when it comes to recruitment. Some of your nonprofit boards, you'll, you'll have seen something like this before, a competency matrix. Um, and so when you're actually building out your minor hockey board, this might be something that you want to take a look at and say, well, you know, maybe it would be really good to have somebody with an accounting background on our board, or maybe somebody with a legal background or banking background, somebody who's really good at risk management, um, somebody who's good at marketing and, and create this little bit of a, of a matrix so that you're very strategic about who, who else you might be wanting to bring into the board from more of that governance kind of perspective, like Kelly was talking about, where maybe you've got two or three people that are really good at policy, um, but they're not necessarily the person that you would have working in the penalty box. And so um, just thinking about that and not forgetting, and I don't know who was the wise person that said hockey, this is about hockey. 
So make sure that they have a passion for hockey and a love for hockey, even if maybe they aren't, you know, having kids in the game right now, that sort of thing. So if there is a price to pay, um, and so this is kind of back to my um, earlier slide where I talked about a role that we might not be able to fill. And so is there a role that you do have constant turnover in um, that maybe the resources could be redirected to compensating that, that role? Um, and sometimes it is the missing piece of a puzzle, a hybrid role where if we do have um, a volunteer activity that just seems too onerous and we can't, can't recruit somebody to do that, then maybe it's time to look at more of a paid model for that particular instance, just thinking outside the box a little bit. So how do we reward our volunteers? This is something that I think sometimes we forget to do. My favorite saying, um, it, besides noses in and fingers out, is that there's only one vertebrae between a pat on the back and a kick in the rear. And we wanna make sure that when it comes to our volunteers, we're rewarding them as much as we can. Um, I did some research on this. And so Saskatchewan's volunteers want to be recognized for their time of and efforts just verbally. Um, the majority of them just want actually literally that, a pat on the back. They just, they might want a little thank you note, um, somebody just to walk up to them and say, hey, thank you um, for, uh, thank you for the time that you spent working on this particular project. Um, we don't need um, trophies and those kinds of things. We just want to be recognized. But here are some other ways that you can reward your hockey volunteers. So first of all, having fun, celebrating successes, being innovative, creating that culture that they want to be part of, right? Engaging them. There's nothing worse than having a whole bunch of volunteers sign up and then not giving them the work. Um, or not giving them enough meaningful work. And also incorporating training and professional development, just like all of you are doing tonight, um, just so that maybe it'll make your job a little bit easier or a little more enjoyable. And then thinking outside the box. And so how can we you know, reward our volunteers just in one other way? And I think I got China there because um, when I was the chamber president um, in 2010 of our chamber in Lloydminster, uh, we had won a trip, a uh, business trip to China to go and tour um, other chambers um, on an exchange, essentially. And our executive director didn't like to fly. So I don't know, Kelly, if you like to fly or not, um, but our executive director at the time didn't. And so as president um, of the organization, I actually got to go to China for 10 days. So that was a pretty cool experience. But again, definitely not why I got involved in the, chi in, in the chamber project, but um, was quite a perk, I will say that for sure. The other thing that we really wanna do is evaluate um, our boards. And, and so there's a number of reasons why we wanna do that. And it's often forgotten. We don't have enough time to do this. But if we want to go from being those good organizations to great organizations, I think it is really important. So how do we do that? Um, well, one of the things we can do is we can ask exiting volunteers just to do a bit of an evaluation through a survey um, or maybe through a little bit of a focus group even. And, and just always not focusing on the problems so much, but focus on the solutions. And so also coming up with some of those exit strategies so that if somebody does want to leave the board, um, or you've got a retiring president, make sure that they stay a friend of the organization. I oftentimes find that when, when people who have given their heart and soul into an organization, when they leave, there's a bit of a void spot that can sometimes turn negative because they might not feel appreciated or needed anymore. It's so important that when someone leaves our organization as a volunteer, we continue to value them, whether it's through, you know, volunteer recognitions, um, evenings, or those kinds of things, and just keep bringing them back in and letting them know how much they're appreciated. So we're going to talk a little bit about being a unified board here as we start to wrap up. And so I just wanted to show you this trust pyramid. And so at the bottom of the pyramid is trust. And that's that, you know, when we're sitting around the board table, um, we're building goodwill, we're, we're making friends, um, we are building trust. And, and that when there is conflict, um, we're treating it more as contrast, which I'm gonna talk about as a sec in a second. And then also just that commitment 
accountability. And then that's where we really start to see those results in our organizations. And, you know, we're focusing on hockey, not focusing on board governance. And so understanding the difference between conflict and contrast. In a good functioning and achieving board, everybody's like-minded and gets along. In a great functioning and high achieving board, few people are like-minded. Everybody respects the process though and values each other's opinions. And this is where your board chair would need to have really good facilitation skills because if they see conflict starting to happen at the table, um, just making sure that everyone is being respectful. One of the easiest ways that you can do this is by implementing a code of conduct. Um, I chair a lot of different organizations and code of conduct is my right hand document, I guess you could say. Um, I always want to have it with me and have my volunteers um, look at a code of conduct ahead of time and sign it, our employees as well. Um, here's an example of a volunteer code of conduct. It's from the Canadian Cancer Society. And, you know, first of all, they talk about their values, that they value honesty, integrity, um, and, and that, you know, when they're volunteering, they're not volunteering for personal gain, that they will identify any conflict of interest and avoid conflict of interest, that they will keep things confidential, that they understand that some of the information they're dealing with is privileged and, and, and it shouldn't be used for personal gain, that they respect intellectual property and respectful conduct. And so this is just a really great code of conduct. I'm sure that many of you have codes of conduct in your organizations. If you don't, I would encourage you to go on and find one that you like for your hockey association. One of the great things you can do is actually add a signature line and a date and have people re-sign it every year. Um, I've had to use this myself several times when I've found that people have uh, kind of lost their minds at a meeting and <laughs> they've started going at it for whatever reason or we've got off topic, um, et cetera. And, uh, and so just to press pause and say, I think it's time to just take a refresh, um, take a look at our code of conduct, bring ourselves back. It's such a more um, cordial approach than calling two people out and saying, you know, hey, you know, you've, you're offensive or, or whatever it is. You can just bring, bring people back to this document that they've signed and um, remind them that they've um, agreed to adhere to these values. If you do have a board member, though, that's derailing your organization, you will have to deal with it. Um, you know, again, first and foremost, bring them back to the code of conduct. Secondly, offer them an out. Um, you know, maybe they um, are looking to resign um, and they just want to have that chat with you. Um, worst case scenario, you might have to fire um, a volunteer. Um, and sometimes it's tough, but it has to happen. I've worked with a lot of organizations where, uh, you know, you've got a great board of 12 people and you've got one bad egg, so to speak and five people have already resigned. And you know that at the end of the day, it's gonna be you and the bad egg that's left if you don't um, get rid of the bad egg. And so the approach though, if you do have to fire a volunteer is very, very important. Um, I like to start with someone's strengths. Um, I do have some funny experiences with this that I, you know, if you ever wanna find out offline what those are, but um, uh, yeah, you know, I've, I've actually never, I can't say that I ever had to sever a relationship with somebody just because I asked them to exit an organization that I was working with. So the importance of communication, um, you know, transparency with our membership is critical. Um, it's important to keep people informed of our decisions, keep them aware. Often this is when if we don't communicate out our important decisions and changes in policy, people will make a mountain out of a molehill. And I know that you've all had experiences with it, this or somebody hears about something and it gets twisted and misconstrued and heaven forbid it gets put on Facebook or Twitter and suddenly you've got um, something that could have been um, nipped, um, you know, really early in the process if we had just had a communication strategy about it. So it is important to know what your policies and regulations are when it comes to some of these important um, drivers of communication aspects, such as like your coach and team uh, selection, how your teams are being formed, affiliation usage, fundraising, um, team swag. Uh, that can be a real um, bee in someone's bonnet if, you know, 
one kid has a leather jacket and the other one has a t-shirt, right? So making sure that everybody understands how that minor hockey association swag um, process goes. And, and then those key policies around, you know, dispute resolution, code of conduct, that sort of thing. But just really important to always be on top of the communication. Never take it for granted that somebody's going to understand a decision. So here's just some communication principles. Um, communication obviously is an exchange of information. Um, it's always, um, and, and not only one-to-one, -one, but there are two processes when communicating and sending and receiving. As a sender, you know, we can use tools and skills to link with another person, but as a receiver, we can use tools and skills to understand what is being conveyed. Information can be exchanged directly through those verbal words or emotions. And then finally, the information can be exchanged indirectly through maybe we've got signage in our rinks, maybe we have a newsletter, um, maybe we send out, you know, email updates, um, voicemails, all of the different ways that we can get through to the um, people that we want to make sure that they understand why we've made a decision or how a decision is being made. But at the end of the day, um, communication does start with you. Um, oftentimes, if we ask ourselves by getting involved in the conversation, am I a adding valuable truths that are alleviating the communication challenge or B, am I stirring the pot and making things worse by adding information that could be confidential? might not be necessary to share or perhaps could even be defamatory. And I can't tell you how many times I've, you know, kind of looked at my two hands before I started a conversation with somebody and said to myself, okay, am I helping the situation or am I stirring the pot? And, and sometimes it's better to just say, you know what, we, yes, I am part of the minor hockey board um, and we need to do a better job of communicating. You got to kind of take that on, even though sometimes our egos can get a little bit damaged and say, we're going to make this right. And I'm going to go back to the group and we'll get out a communication strategy or that sort of thing. But kind of having that, um, you know, almost rote message um, to take some of that criticism. Sometimes we've got to have broad shoulders um, and uh, compassionate hearts, I think, um, when we're hearing some of that uh, negative feedback sometimes. After you've made a decision though, um, for the ownership um, of your lo local minor hockey associations, your first and foremost thing is to remember that you represent the membership or the owners of the organization. So follow your policies on those decisions just to ensure consistency in future decision-making. That's why we have bylaws, policies and procedures in place so that we're not always reinventing the wheel. This prevents that fluctuation and wavering in decision-making models. And here's just a little bit of a flow chart of an example of a communication process. I found this from um, another minor hockey association. I thought it was excellent. Um, and it just had a communication protocol. And so if there is an issue or concern from membership, first bring it forward to the manager, deal with it at that level. Um, you can kind of go through this on your own. I'm thinking we're sending out these slides. Um, they have a 24 hour rule. They have a grievance committee. Um, and so just making sure that this information of a communication process for your minor hockey association is available and that you've thought this out. And again, this could be something that if you don't have something like this in place, you could task to two or three people as a committee to do a bit of a best practice review, find a communication process protocol that looks right for your organization and your community, and then send it out and implement it. So. We have covered a lot tonight. Um, I would like to say our mission is accomplished, but I definitely um, want to just turn it over to you um, to find out if you have any questions or things to add, experiences. Um, at our next session, we're going to talk about financial literacy, um, a little bit more on risk awareness and aversion. We're also going to talk about um, a little bit more on that um, communication and transparency to membership and how to run effective and efficient meetings and conflict of interest. Oh, we're going to have a lot of fun things at the next session, Kelly. You bet we are. Uh, Brooklyn's asking if there's an ideal number of uh, board members for a board or does the MHA have a policy on this? And I think it's 
It really depends on the size of your organization and the complexity of it uh, in terms of how many people you need. And are you a hybrid board or are you a governance board, right? So that's really important in terms of uh, uh, the size. So you can think about our organization. When I started, there was 28 board members. You know, but that was before the internet. So, you know, and and right around just after Jesus was born. So, uh, you know, there was a lot more of we needed we needed almost uh, board members that were foot soldiers and going out and and discussing things with the membership. And now, you know, we have we have thirteen staff members. It's a whole different world than it was, you know, in the early '90s. So we went to a board of nine that is primarily focused on governance and and creating they're doing a lot of work on creating good good policies a strategic plan and then you know putting me uh in in place to be responsible for all of that and achieve, you know achieving it through an operational uh plan which Wendy's going to help me with you know in terms of being more accountable to the board in those areas so it really depends on the size of your association uh, one thing I was going to say that a lot uh, for me personally, I think where uh, sometimes some boards uh, in minor hockey associations that might have maybe, you know, five or six age groups, they tend to have someone from every team be on their board. And I'm not sure that's the most positive structure. I think you need, obviously, majority of people on your board are going to have kids that are playing hockey. But that's where that really adds a, another layer of conflict of interest uh, in terms of when it comes to decision making and disclosing things. So I think it's uh, probably important that, you know, in the structure of your board, you don't have that type of structure uh, because it's your members who should be electing people to serve in, in the roles. So ultimately, it's your members have a say. And then it comes back to as Wendy talked about at the end, the communication that you get back to your, your members. If you're not communicating with them, then that creates all the lobby talk and, and all the conspiracy theories and, 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 the, and the bad reputation and the conflict of interest allegations, et cetera. So, you know, if, you, if, you, if your members elect uh, good people and, and those people have created really good roles and, um, and job descriptions, and they're communicating freely with the membership, uh, the less issues you're going to have. So it's one of the reasons why we're trying to do now, you know, with with COVID, a virtual call once a month. You know, we know that a lot of a lot of people aren't going to attend, but we make the recording and the PowerPoint available, so a lot of people are 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 accessing it at their at their leisure, which was far better than when I would drive around the province twice a year. And sometimes because of weather, you know, I'd be somewhere and five people would show up. And, and so you're not really impacting uh, as much as we can when we do the virtual part. So, you know, it, I, can, I know I'm, that's, that's the political answer, but you know, it also, it just really depends on the size of your organization. Yeah, and, and you know what, Brooklyn, what I'll do is I'll actually throw up a couple of templates at the next session of, of maybe a, a small, midsize and large minor hockey uh, board and what that could look like um, so that you've kind of got three samples you can go from. So I'll, I'll add that into uh, the next session. Awesome. Any other questions, comments, thoughts, things that you'd like added to next week's session that um, we haven't talked about already, which um, I think we've kind of given you a bit of an overview of what we're going to handle. But well, and I think also, Wendy, that I really encourage uh, all of you to to come to the next session and even invite some of your other board members. Uh, and then afterwards, after the two sessions, I want to do a survey of everyone. And is there topics that are more uh, you want to go more in depth in that we could look at doing? Uh, more sessions down the road because ultimately we want the success of hockey saskatchewan is because of its members and and you're the ones that represent our members so you know uh you're you're doing all the groundwork for us and so we want to see we be success as successful as you can because it it ultimately it makes us look good right so uh i think uh the more that we can do 
And I know we've got some plans, even from a staffing perspective, having you know a staff resource down the road that can help you with all of these types of things. So uh, thank you for everybody for taking your time out on, on, a, on a cold winter night and uh, yeah. look forward to everybody uh, coming back next Thursday. Uh, as I've said in the chat, we will, uh, you'll see some emails from Joe. We'll be circulating the recording to all of you that were here and then to every association uh, contact that we have so that uh, they are sharing it as well. But we encourage you to come back next week. And I really encourage you to think about ask, asking lots of questions. And I see there's a couple questions in the chat, Kelly, about okay. what size of minor hockey association would it be acceptable to hire? And so I'll add in a couple of slides on making those decisions as well. Awesome. Thanks, everyone. I, I really enjoyed um, having you all, uh, I guess, listen to my love for nonprofit <laughs> governance. Um, I hope you enjoyed it. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Wendy.